Welcome, everyone. This is the FR Rowden workshop. Our goal today really is to talk about the direction and try to maybe make some decisions about how we want to handle things in the future. And from my perspective, I would, would really like to have audience participation. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. And, uh, and we can have the conversation. All right. Oh, and after the presentation, if you want a sticker, I have a whole bunch. Come free, feel free to get one. Yeah. Uh, all right. By the way, I'm Donald Sharp, and this is David Lampartier. We are both on the TSC committee for FR Rowden, and we help shepherd and move the, the project forward, I guess. That's what we do. All right. You want to start? Um, sure. Um, so the way this is organized is we just have rough overview slides for various topics. Um, and we hope that there are questions for them. Um, we can spend some time uh, talking about things if there's interest. Um, we will be perfectly happy to skip over things if there's no interest. So um, please make your interest uh, heard somehow. Um, start is this actually has a separate presentation after this. So um, we have ongoing work in uh, for routing to decouple the data plane um, from the current kernel interfaces that we have. So previously, you had a compiled in choice of using either the BSD backend or the Netlink backend. And that started getting extended. And now there is interest in having this more modular and multi-threaded and um, so this is ongoing work and I don't think we should spend too much time on it um, because we have a separate talk about this afterwards. I believe it's in this room immediately after and you're presenting it. Emmanuel? All right, nice to meet you. Oh, um, it is worth pointing out that this is also related to um, things like having more than one data plane and um, having some kind of filter for the data plane and stuff like that, but a lot about it later. Um, this is your work. Yeah, this is my work. So, so as some of you are probably aware, the Linux kernel is getting support for the abstraction of next top groups. And what that effectively means is that you can um, talk about an ECMP-ness of your route via um, identifiers. And when you install on the kernel, you can just say, install route A with next top group B, and it will automatically set it up for you. So I see some concern. Do you have a, does that make, is that clear what I'm trying to say there? No, all right. So the goal from that perspective is to allow the quicker insertion of routes into the kernel. And what that is gonna cause us to have to do is to bring in a change to Zebra to allow us to talk about next top groups and to also abstract next top groups so that they're, um, you only have one of them in the system for each next top group. So currently in Zebra, I don't have it displayed here, but each route entry will have its own next top graded data structure and its own next tops. And then so route entry one will have its own next tops, route entry two will have its own next tops. And what we're going to end up doing is changing the route entries so that each route entry one and two, they both have the same next top group. So they will both point to the same next top group. And so we'll reduce memory usage and also hopefully speed up insertion times into the Linux kernel. So is David actually here? Oh, paper? No, he's not. He's got another. He's got another. So, so David Ahern is the guy doing the work in the Linux kernel, and he has a presentation at the last NetDev 12 that he talked about next top groups and how it was going to work. And as I understand it, it, the patches for that will be going into the Linux kernel in the next couple of weeks or month. They'll be, well, I shouldn't say going in, they'll be put upstream for, for submittal. So is anyone concerned about those patches? Has anyone looked at them for the kernel side? Well, okay. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess this is just ongoing development, and hopefully, all the design for Bar and so on has been worked out. And um, at this point, I would hope that it's just work getting done, and we might have the user space support pretty quickly after the kernel support lands, maybe well, even before. We actually have 
code right now. Well, we, so Cumulus is working on a bit of code that to take advantage of that. David Ahern is, is, is the kernel guy and he works at Cumulus and, and we actually have access to the patches and are, have got code going right now. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks or month we'll have a patch request for that, pull request for that. Okay, let's get started on the first performance nest in this. Um, how many people are aware of the VRF uh, support that FR routing has, like in terms of how it's implemented? Can you show of hands or something or just hum? Okay, that's not a lot of people. Um, so to give you a little bit of context, um, right now you can kind of choose in FR routing um, if you want to have support multiple VRFs. Um, you can either use the, the L3 MDEF support that is in the kernel, so you create a VRF master device and um, use the facilities uh, associated with that, or uh, FR routing can work with multiple network namespaces where each network namespace is treated as a separate VRF, so it installs routes into a separate network namespace. Um, let, let's put this politely, um, this, this dual support is uh, causing a lot of maintenance work because the, the behavior and semantics are very dissimilar between the two models. Um, we've, we do have an open PR that is trying to implement route leaking between VRFs on top of network namespaces. So the only way this can work is through a virtual event between <laughs> network namespaces. And um, let, let, let's say it's, it's far from trivial. Um, I don't think anyone from Six Flight is here. Question mark. Doesn't doesn't seem like it. Um, let, let me ask a different question. Um, I, I assume people here know what FR routing is, and are at least some of you are maybe using it. Um, is anyone using network namespaces as VRFs in the room right here? Is anyone using the the VRF support for VRFs? So just using VRFs. Okay, so that, that's at least three hands. Um, I guess this is not exactly a represent, representative survey or anything, but um, that's kind of the situation we're we are seeing as well. And um, so just to give a little bit more background, part of the the original one of the original thoughts that we had was to allow FR Routin to to work kind of like Cisco's logical routers or VDCs, and the original thought from my perspective was to use namespaces for that because namespaces really kind of map into the VDC world and the fact that it's a hard, hard separation between uh, the, 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 the different routing tables as well as the interfaces. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the, so, so now that we have both VRFs and namespaces as ability to be, to be used as VRFs, you kind of lose the ability to do logical routers using namespaces as well as VRFs. And it, it gets into this weird level of a double level of indirection, which I think is a great way to, to, to work. And I think it also introduces a whole bunch of bugs. And so one of the goals that we were hoping to get done today is to figure out what we want to do as a group with verse versus namespaces. Do we want to continue to support namespaces? Um, are there other opportunities for uh, creating verfs or using verfs on non-Linux kernels, I know this is a Linux conference, but BSD, for instance, has uh, an abstraction to that could possibly let you use, create a VRF as well. So does anyone have any concerns or questions about that? Um, you know, uh, I was using uh, FRR for uh, as a replacement to um, traditional and legacy uh, network equipment. But if you're favoring for, um, let's say, cloud deployments where you have um, in top of racks, you know, uh, 20, 50, 100 of, um, of networks, and you would like to, um, to work in an isolated networking environment, then you know that the um, the closest the, uh, neighbor, it's the namespace and not the uh, VFR. So um, in which uh, environment you would like your um, product to live? Um, so 
in, in general, we are trying to not bind a for routing to a specific use case. So it's, it's still usable in data centers. It's still usable for a telco to actually implement the border router on the network. It's also useful to implement an interior router. Uh, so um, a small comment on that. So I mean, if you are favoring for um, namespace, you have all these kind of um, uh, armor of you know programmability in terms of um, the namespaces, where you don't have all the um, programmability for the VRF type of site because you know the API. You have to resort to CLI at some point of stuff, not to API. I mean, can you do everything with a I mean, I mean, um, in VRF, uh, when you set up your VRF, I mean, so you'd like to program uh, hundreds of uh, networks inside um, inside the cloud. So typically, you end up with a CLI type of configuring uh, the uh, the instances of that. So this is an intermediate step for configuring uh, the um, the environment. While in uh, namespace, you don't have kind of CLI uh, island. So you go with the API of the namespace capabilities. And you do whatever you know, it is. Um, so I'm still not sure if I follow, but um, if I have some, some or, so first of all, if I have some random container um, that is just a service that is running in the cloud that normally wouldn't have anything to do with ever routing because it wouldn't normally contain routing functionality. And if it is completely isolated and does routing, then there's also nothing to consider here because it's just an isolated service that just runs a completely separate copy of ever um, If I'm configuring the router itself and I want to do VRFs in the, in the setup, I don't see a huge difference between issuing a bunch of IP route commands to set up the VRF device or a bunch of IP route commands that set up the network namespace for this. At the end of the day, there's no different, you're right. So I, I don't think any of the existing cloud orchestration stuff is useful for network namespaces that are being used as VRFs. So the, the reason I say that is, in this case, it's really just a network namespace. There's no, no separate file system, no separate whatever else namespacing you have. Um, it's, it's essentially just a separate network stack for the same system. And I, I really see that as more of a downside, because it, it makes things invisible to the inexperienced admins, and it also is a much more expensive abstraction. So the network namespace in the kernel is I believe, more costly than the VRF device. Well, so uh, I think one thing we didn't actually touch on is that if you want to tap communication between namespaces, you have to actually create a meth, you know, a tap device, you have to insert it into each side, and then you actually have to add routing between you. And then that doesn't even take into account things like if you want to start doing a burp route leak, and we kind of mentioned that earlier, earlier but with the L3 embed device, when I would do route leaking, it's just a simple, Use this next hop in this other route, in uh, this other birth, and things just work. You can't do that. You have to actually come, we have to actually, in order to support these basics and route leaking, we have to actually spend, come up with an architecture that that we support and allow end users to 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 configure, and then and then they have to do additional configuration inside of the inside of the FR route itself to to make that work. At, at least that's what I see right now, but I don't know necessarily that that's the the end goals. So I'm not sure if you answered your question, but... But, I mean, haven't you given your answer yourself? I mean, as you said, right, the, the namespaces originally were meant for, you know, very strict isolation, and that means you simply run another instance of FR, right? And the fact that, you know, with all type of workaround of the Ethernet or so, the namespaces have, in the meantime, been used for all type of crazy things, probably had to do with the fact that the VRF code came a lot later, right? So now that the VRF code is there, you know, I think it's fairly logical to, you know, constrict FR to support v uh, VRFs and then, you know, the namespace is only to the extent that if you're starting multiple instances independently of each other, it's maybe just have global parameters or so, which namespace they're for, which config files and so, because as you said, they don't necessarily have a different file system context, so you may want yeah, to parameterize yeah. that. 
that, that already exists. So right. there's a namespacing. Yeah. yeah. So um, just just to add as a note here, personally, I 100% agree with you, um, but we need to bring the entire community along to this. That is why we are discussing this here. So, so just so to kind of extend the question, does anyone <coughs> plan to run FR Robin inside of logical routers? Probably, probably the wrong, wrong audience because we need operate, operators to answer that question. <laughs> um, well. I, th I think we got as much input as we're going to get here. Um, oh, okay. All right, so this is more of an informational slide to kind of talk a little bit about what's been going on in BGP. So I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that BGP is extremely memory intensive. And um, one of the things I've been thinking about doing was, so it's current behavior in BGP, there is, instead of a route node, which is a, the data structure we use to track the, 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 the route in a table, BGP has its own thing called a BGP node, which is this, uh, it's about 160 bytes of data, and a route node is like 70 bytes of data, 80 bytes of data. And um, so every single, node in a BGP table takes up 160 bytes, and if I have a full BGP feed, that's 700,000 nodes. And then the way we've structured the table data structure in FR is that there is an extra probably 500,000 nodes that are placeholders. And in BGP we have, so we have a BGP node for every single one of those, so that's 160 bytes versus the 80 bytes. And that gets, you know, when you have a full feed, that start adding up a whole bunch. And so one of the things I've been kind of doing is, is separating out the route node code and creating a new data structure called BGP Dust. And this is going to follow the same structure that's in Zebra for panel tables. So Zebra has the route node, and it's got a pointer to the rib dust key, so we're going to model that with a BGP Dust. And we don't, won't create the BGP desk pointer unless there's an actual BGP data. And so, so that's kind of what we're doing there. Um, and the other thing that's come up recently is that there is this idea of, of SAFI specific or extra information that we're storing. And if you're doing things like VPNs or um, if you're doing a, a VPN or you're doing flow spec, you'll end up with uh, an extra pointer that's probably an extra two or 300 bytes as well. So, so the goal from, from that perspective is that, is that some, if, if you're doing uh, flow spec on your average, you know, you're using flow spec, you don't necessarily care about the extra data for VPNs. And so what we want to do is break up the extra pointer. It's down there a little bit farther. I think it's in each of the Yeah, it's in it's, yeah. yeah. It, I'll find you. You keep talking. I do. The All right. So, so, so the thing we'd like to do is break up the extra data into SAFI specific data that we can be loaded at at um, runtime, and we wanted to see if there was any input from the uh, from the from the audience here about ways that we could possibly break up the data as well. If there's been any thought there. Yeah, it's the path info extra data structure. So, yeah, speaking from an engineering standpoint, I mean, this is a kind of generic thing that everyone hits. It's, it's a lot of extra information that we need to keep up, keep around in some conditional cases. And, um, well, once again, we need to find a solution for it. And so the, the current thought, of course, is to create uh, like maybe an array of, of SAFIs that you can have pointers that you can, as you as you as you allocate memory for that, you would create the. Point. All right. So that's the the direction we're going. All right. Any questions? Okay, um, who here knows what Metconf and Yang are? Oh, that's more people than me. Okay, so um, <laughs> for, for the rest of you, um, the ITF. Can we pass through the microphone? 
It's a question on the previous slide. When you do this memory rework, how much memory are you going to save? Uh, just an estimation for say. So a full BGP, full BGP feed is probably like 500 megabytes, and it's going to probably cut it down to the 460 or 450. So it's not huge, but it's something. But you got to you got to start somewhere, right? So that's kind of the. <laughs> Fifty <laughs> makes still good enough. <laughs> no, it, 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 and I agree. It's not huge. The, the goal really is, is, you know, it's with all memory management, it can be death by a thousand cuts, right? You know, I need this new extra bit of data here, and then I need and then this other feature needs this new other bit of data over here, and then all of a sudden you have a, a your your memory is just shooting to the roof, and so you you actually have to spend time thinking about how you can structure your data in ways that you don't create so much memory. And, and that's kind of the process. This is the start of that process from my perspective. And I, I know it's not the final step. I know there's going to be more work there. I just know that it's the right first step. So that's kind of where I am. OK, so that coming in. Um, this is probably going to be a short one, but uh, the point here is to allow people to ask questions. Um, NetCon and Yang are, um, well, drafts that the ITF, well, not, not drafts anymore, RFCs that the, RTF, that the, the ITF has for um, a common way of configuring and extracting state uh, from network devices. So basically, it's, it's the successor to SNMP. Hopefully, it's going to suck less. Um, well, there is already support for it in FRR for RIP, uh, RIPNG, and ISIS. Um, all of them use uh, custom models, so they don't use uh, any of the ITF uh, well standardized models. Um, but that's step two um, there, basically. Um, and um, I'm just going to ask if anyone has any questions. Well, I actually like to point out that the people who written that code are in the audience, Renato and Manuel, you both, both Renato did rip, he did the initial work for NetCoff and Yang and added to rip and rip and GD, and Emmanuel did the is it work, so thank you both. Is anyone doing any other work by doing this? I'm not actually currently aware of anyone doing specific work at this point in time. I think it's from, from a TSC perspective, I think it's just a matter of someone having a need for it. I, I know companies are interested. I don't know anyone's doing specific work at this point in time. Yeah, I haven't looked at <clears throat> that code, but it would be interesting to understand if it's mostly for provisioning or also um, for uh, you know um, monitoring, like you know what the MIPS mostly have been for the current netconf code that you have. It is intended to be used for monitoring. Um, I think for now we mostly have configuration. Um, but it's it's very much on the roadmap. Um, it's just additional work that needs to be done. The, the entire thing is someone needs to be interested in do the work. That that is the you know from our perspective we you know I should say our the, from the FRL company's perspective company <laughs> FRL <laughs> perspective we we wanted to put an infrastructure in place that allowed people to build on it and it wasn't. Hard, and maybe Manuel can speak speak for about that. How hard it was to add for his is, but you know, you, we want the ability for people to add it easily, and we want the ability to extend it in the future. That was the, that was my main goal for what I wanted out of it, as opposed to getting net company in particular. Yeah, if, if you're in trending in for monitoring, like you know, route change tracking or something like that, then uh, have you looked into Yang Push? Yeah. So because, I mean, that's kind of the uh, Yang framework that you may want to use to set up, you know, ongoing, recurring, you know, um, yeah. data oh, being yeah. sent back. On Whether NetConf is actually the best transport for that is yet another question, right? But uh, in the end, uh, I think the, the Yang push might be the first thing you want to look at to, to get that infrastructure right. Uh, we, are, we are aware of the, of the standards and the possibilities, so to speak. Um, I agree that NetConf is maybe not the best transport for a route push, um, but at, so at this point, it's a question of who is sufficiently interested in it to put the work in. And um, I mean, it's 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 also going to be their choice what they implement. Um, so yeah. So so 
Um, wh what is the status of the implementation yet? Um, is it just you have tried something, but it's not, for example, you cannot still configure through NetConf yet, or it something is there, but there's not so much implemented, or what is the status? So, so just to reiterate, Renato did the initial work, and he's done. He's the guy who is the most. So what is the question? So I, I don't think we'll know the current status of the so basically, we have an infrastructure to support NetConf and RESTConf. Mm -hmm. And for that, we have modules to integrate with both uh, ConfD and SysRipple, which are two different projects. So uh, as of now, you can configure and monitor FR using uh, NetConf and RESTConf if you use these modules. And uh, basically, the only issue is that only a few demons were converted to use this new infrastructure, which were RIP the RIP NGD and ISSD by the Manuel. So the goal in the long term is to convert the remaining demons to use Yang modeling, and, and that's it. It works now, we have the whole infrastructure, but it's only a matter of converting the rest uh, demons so everything of FR can be, um, can be configured and monitored using that conf or whatever else. And also, um, and beyond that conf and the rest conf, uh, we also have a new gRPC um, module, which can be used to configure and monitor FR, and we support both configuration, operational data, RPCs, uh, and, and notifications. So the whole package is, is supported. So for the model itself, are we using kind of ITF-based model, or which, which one are we using? Yeah. Everyone asks this question, why you are using uh, native models instead of using standard models? So the thing is that uh, the FR code base is huge, and converting to use uh, the Yang uh, infrastructure is already a huge challenge. It requires lots of changes in code, and we think that doing everything in a single step will be um, too much work, too much changes in one time, and it could lead to lots of uh, bugs. So we decide to split this work in two different steps. And the first step is to uh, just convert the existing CLI comments to like, to, to, how can I say, we can map the existing comments to, uh, to a Yang model. And then in the second step, the idea is to uh, effectively try to support the standard models natively. And the one thing I'd like to add to that answer is that the Yang models don't always reflect FRAUTO's abilities. We have some features and functionality that are not in the standard Yang models. And, and given the choice between dropping that functionality versus creating our own, we're going to create our own, is what it boils down to. I'm not going to be tied down by I. The community, I don't believe, should be tied down by the that the limited functionality of the models that are from the ITF. And there's a question back there. If you're, if you're yeah, I, actually, I think I agree that I, I think the standard is for if there is same thing, use same thing. If not, use your own. I I do a lot of Yang stuff, so uh, you'd want to augment the standard models, right? Yeah. That, that, that I, I just don't want to get into this <laughs> this world of I I have a feature or a special functionality that all of a sudden can't be configured through NetConf Yang, and I'm gonna I, I, I'd rather drop NetConf Yang than lose some of the features. Um, if I if I can add on to that, so the, my rationale for supporting this approach is that it is much easier to create an exact mapping of FRR's capabilities into Yang as a first step, and then have a layer on top of that that, that just translates from the one Yang model to the proper standardized one. And at that point, since you're operating between the Yang models, um, the, the choice of tooling is much more wide and we can just I don't know, leave, leave C behind, for example, because C is not exactly the best language to do configuration manipulation, stuff like that. Um, I don't know, 
Rust is cool or something, <laughs> or Python. Um, and um, it, it can just be a layer on top. And it's, I personally, I definitely want to have support for, a for the standard models in FRR, and we definitely need to augment them in some cases. I think in some other cases, we also don't quite support as much as the model needs to make sense, which is a bigger problem than the other way around, really. Um, but, yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's what you're supposed to do, and then there's actually getting work done. So, you don't actually have to support it. <laughs> um, for reference, if anyone's interested, I did put up the code on, on the protector here. This is a very simple CLI function in RIP, and this, the CLI just calls the markbound API functions, and it does the reverse to get the data back out. And, um, yeah, the model is FRR specific currently. And, um, yeah, you can find all of this in, in the Git repo. Uh, just, I mean, you should never feel confined by, you know, the IETF standards models, right? I mean, it's a committee process. It's basically lowest common denominator, right? So if not the majority of vendors implement something, then basically it's not in the Yang model. So it's perfectly fine to do your own Yang model, except for, you know, if you're doing something that's actually in some IETF RFCs, and it's a standard thing, and it's not in the IETF standard, Yang model, then that Yang model needs to be extended as opposed. I mean, that would be more work for you, but always encouraged. Yeah. Uh, kind of a, two questions. Um, is there concern that from a, a protocol implementation for Yang right now, like the, the implementations that are there, that uh, there will be, let's say there's no interested party in adding it to BGP or OSPF, right? Something along those lines. So you're gonna have feature divergence within FR routing about what protocol you're using, whether you can use it or not. And then kind of the follow-up to that is, is there going to be a requirement for new features that are added that they're compliant or that they include the Yang hooks as well? So the, the first, to answer the first question, welcome to open source. <laughs> um, and I don't mean to be flippant about that, but the, the reality is is that some company needs to come forward and, and, and do that work. Um, I, you know, I said that there's, I'm not aware of anyone doing the work right now. I, I am aware of people planning to do things like BGP and using that company in the future. They just haven't gotten to it yet. And so I, I don't want to be up here saying company X is going to be doing it when, when they haven't announced it themselves. So that's kind of where I, my table went. And the second question, I don't remember what it was. I'm sorry. Uh, just about, just, you know, yeah. Oh, it's a good question. Yes. New feature should probably use NetConf Yang if <coughs> that existing feature already is using NetConf Yang. Yeah, it's, it's, it's also very obvious if you're adding a CLI function and it doesn't use the Yang, the Yang backend. So. And, and maybe, you know, per the standards bodies, that was more of a should, shall, must you know, type declaration. I, it's, it's, it's this interesting, you know, balancing act between getting people to do work for you versus, wow, that's a great new feature, let's take it, right? So, okay. Okay, um, so this is, um, one of my pet peeves. <laughs> um, I don't know how many people here have looked at the library facilities <coughs> that have an FRR. Um, let's just say most of them were written in the 90s, um, and you can pretty much see that. Um, so we, we basically have an, have an ongoing effort to try and uh, make our APIs just suck less. Um, there's really stupid things in there, like our hash table implementation uses a separate piece of memory with three pointers for each entry that just has an next pointer and a data pointer. And that's really not modern code. Modern code is you embed the, the node into the data structure, something like that. Um, and we've, we've also grown somewhat concerned about the safety of our APIs for human consumption, so to speak. Um, there are quite a few pitfalls in the code base where it's, it's just far too easy to do something wrong and the only notes is a year later when it explodes on some installation and um, yeah. Um, one of the re related topics is that we currently have a, a relatively strict uh, 
procedure for getting rid of, of old features. Um, there is a normally like half a year to a year of deprecation period, um, which is something that might be worth evaluating. Um, although our our, our um, workflow document does say that in cases where it's not viable to keep the backwards uh, compatibility, that we will just drop it immediately. Um, but I, I don't think we have enough for our uh, active contributors here to, to actively discuss procedure. So let's not talk about procedure. Also, it's boring. So. <laughs> Um, and um, there's also that since we're growing more into a multi threaded direction that um, it's, it's becoming useful to, to apply concepts of, of immutability to, to places where it's possible like, like PGP attribute structures and um, so the, the, the way of, like the kernel does this in a lot of places where an object is allocated um, and after it's released in, in RCU semantics, it's, it's not updated anymore and you just copy the entire thing if you need to change something. Um, and we're, well, I'm, I'm trying to get that into FRR as well. Um, doing, doing full RCU in user space is maybe a bit of a far reach. Um, I don't know if anyone has any opinions about that. I would be happy to hear them as well. Um, other than that, this is also just a, well, Things are getting done. Slide. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take co complaints about the code quality. <laughs> um, any any related questions? I guess the one point I'd like to point out. One thing I'd like to point out is that, from our perspective, the APIs shouldn't be written in a way that allow you to make mistakes, and that is a common theme with our current lib directory is that it's very easy and, to, and trivial in some cases to do things that are both stupid and dangerous. And so, so from my perspective, I want to encourage people to spend time thinking about the API and how it can be used in a way that won't cause you to shoot yourself in the foot. So I mean, we kind of say that, but I, it's really important to me. And, I, and when people make changes to the lib directory, that's one of the things I'm looking at when I review the code. And spend time thinking about is is how how we maybe misuse this and how we can better shape the API. Yeah, uh, well, who doesn't know this problem? Um, in in some cases, we can't even test things because we don't know what, how they're supposed to work, which. Um, is not a very great situation to be in. Um, if people know, so um, Z API is the protocol that we have between our various routing protocols um, and the Zebra centralized daemon that, that integrates all of the configuration, that ah, routing data, sorry. Um, and there is essentially very little specification about how that is supposed to work, especially in current cases. Um, Code documentation is scarce at best. Um, and we do, well, there, there are some questions here on, on how and where to, to document best. And that, that also extends to our user documentation. Um, if, if you remember the, the Yang slide of the Yang code I had earlier, um, you can see we have this defund thing in the source code, each of which defines a CLI function. And, um, it's certainly a possibility to put, to put the documentation right there in the code, which would improve our, well, remembering to update it when we change the code. Um, unfortunately, I, I again think that we don't quite have enough for our active contributors here to really discuss this, but um, if anyone has any input or comments on this, um, well, so yeah. to, to, to further is uh, all new pull requests, changing the CLI, you're going to have to update the documentation. That's rule one. It's making sure that I'm calling that out now. And if you're adding new functionality, we're going to probably ask for a test as well. So there's a whole test infrastructure internal to, to FR Robin that you can just run via make total test and it will automatically run your testing. And that, as people add new features now, it's become extremely clear that you're going to have to 
we're going to have to require test code because otherwise we have nothing to know that we have. We, no one's going to. No one's breaking you in the future. Uh, are you asking for someone who can document the existing API, or are you asking the who writes the new code to write document properly? Yes, both. Bo both. <laughs> both. It's it's you know, the reality is the you know. Ever Adam has 20 plus years of history, and for a long time, it was okay to add a new feature and not write any documentation. Mm -hmm. And so we, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of features that people don't know about. I mean, I still find new features by looking at the code. And go, oh, I can do that. That's great. And, and, and the only way I knew about it was I happened to read that line of code that said, oh. So, so it's great that people have added features, and, and FRL really is, has a lot of features that people don't know about and aren't used necessarily, but not everyone reads code. Not every operator has the interest in reading code, so we need to provide to the end user the ability to know what's there. And so, and it's just, it's just you know, we're developers. We're not doc readers, and we're not testers, and, that becomes kind of put on the side from, from a development perspective, but from a community perspective, we can't allow that. So that's kind of the point of this slide is that, is that we just want to make it known that that's kind of what we're doing and, and why we're doing that. Well, um, it's our last slide, actually. Yeah. Um, Probably again not the best place, but still um, we're we're trying to figure out process issues. Actually, I think this is the right place. So it's, if um, we probably have community people who use Eparat here, Do, is there things that we could be doing better? Things you'd like us to be doing different? Let, let's just open it up. Let's just open the, the room generally, and um, any any FRR related comment, question, anything, um, go ahead. Any any current people want to know what the user plan is? Terrified by or <laughs> yeah maybe uh, let's get the mic up there. Since you seem to be asking uh, for operator, so we are an operator. We run um, FRR as part of Cumulus Linux in our data center networks, and um, so my team people don't generally have a, a traditional CLI background. Um, Personally, I, I do have that, and uh, I, I feel very comfortable um, looking at things in, in FRR now. It's, it's very like the old uh, ways. At the same time, we provision everything using Ansible and templates. That works fine, too, and it's, uh, it's uh, a nice mix of, of those words. Yeah. Um, I, also, I would like to thank you for, um, for doing this, because um, we started when uh, our software vendor still used Quagga, and it's really improved the whole usability and um, of the system. It's really uh, getting much nicer. It's, uh, so yeah, a big, big kudos to uh, all the people involved here. So we use uh, mostly BGP for the classical uh, least spine data center network, um, including the service. It's also a nice thing because we run the same software, well, sometimes different versions, uh, whatever we get from our vendor or upstream on the service and then on the switches. It's nice in our case. We provision them using the same system, sometimes same templates. We do have sometimes regressions, like right now we have a, a funny um, bug when we upgraded the router OS, uh, RBGP peerings, or the routes were no longer accepted because we were configuring some, I don't know, uh, global IPv6 addresses where they were not expected. But um, I mean, it's just uh, things that happen. We, we have to learn how to, um, how to navigate these changes. We, we're not using upstream FRR. Maybe, maybe we could. I don't know how realistic that is on the switches. Um, we're using generally what we get from the vendor. And yeah, um, as I said, I'm, I'm 
fairly happy. It's uh, it's gotten much uh, much closer to something that I would like um, suggest my my former colleagues who still work with uh, Cisco to look at as, as something that is uh, actually uh, usable. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the so so these people in my in my former uh, team they look more at things like NetConf and Yang and uh, new practices. So uh, yeah, I'd, I think I'd like to echo. Um, for them that um, this is an interesting feel and of course uh, it would be nice if you could try to embrace these um, standards um, schemas like uh, what the ITF produces also what I think open config uh, produces it's uh, it seems to be very influential and maybe more comprehensive that than what the, the ITF committee process yeah. absolutely. I absolutely agree and again this is just the, the one step at a time thing that is visible here Any other questions? Well, I suppose we have five or twelve minutes left over. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> get get your stickers. Yeah, I think you want to start a bit.